Okay, in this lecture we're going to start investigating how we improve our matching networks. Namely, we saw that there were limitations with two element matching networks, and so now we're going to see what happens when we start to add more elements, for instance, three elements. Now the primary concern we had with a two element match was that we couldn't simultaneously control the quality factor, Q, the transformation ratio, Rs over RL, and the frequency of resonance all at the same time. Typically, we're forced to control two of these. Transformation ratio is a necessary circuit and condition, and the frequency of operation is a necessary condition. And so we have to sacrifice Q with the two element matching network. Our solution is going to be at, to add another degree of freedom. And we have a couple of examples of three element matching networks. So our three element choices are called a T match or a pi match. And sometimes if you look at old circuit te textbooks, you'll see these called a Y network or delta network respectively. And we have a couple of special cases that include a tapped inductor or a tapped capacitor. So we're going to start by examining our pi match in a low pass configuration. And what we, we mean by low pass configuration is that there's an inductor in series between the source and load terminations. To solve this network, we're going to split L into L1 and L2. And so I'm gonna redraw the circuit right now. Okay, so I've virtually split L1 and L2 into, uh, er, sorry, L into uh, virtual inductances L1 and L2. And if you'll notice now we have two independent matching networks, RS being transformed up to an intermediate impedance, or, or I should say down to an intermediate impedance, and RL being transformed down to an intermediate impedance through the respective low pass networks. Let's examine this in a bit more detail. Okay, so we know that we have a left network that consists of RS, C1, and L1, and a right network that consists of L2, C2, and RL, and that the sum of the inductors L1 and L2 equals our original L in our network. So we can look at the impedance transformation from RS to our intermediate impedance, RI, and we'll find that this impedance transformation is a downward transformation. In other words, the intermediate impedance is less than the source impedance. And this is natural. We have a shunt element next to our source impedance and a series element next to the intermediate uh, element. Next, if we look at the transformation from RL to RI, we notice that this is also a downward transformation. In other words, RI is less than RL. And again, C2 is shunt with RL and L2 is series with RI. We now look at the total quality factor of the network, Q total. The total quality factor is the sum of Q left and Q right. In other words, Q total is equal to the square root of RS over RI minus one, plus the square root of RL over RI minus one. Effectively, we have two independent matching networks now, the left network and the right network, each doing their respective impedance transformations. So to design our network, given a load resistance, a source resistance, and a resonance frequency, we can pick the total quality factor and solve for the intermediate impedance that achieves that quality factor. And then we follow a two element procedure for the left and right networks, uh, as we learned in the previous lecture. And at the end, we can combine L1 and L2 by adding them in series. All right, next we're going to look at the T matching network in a low pass configuration. This is a low pass configuration because we have inductors in series between the source impedance and the load impedance. And it looks kind of like the letter T. What we're going to do is similar to what we did with the pi matching network. We're going to split this into two upward transformation networks. 
Our upper transformation networks go from RS to RI using components L1 and C1, and from RL to RI using components L2 and C2. In this configuration, in this configuration, the intermediate resistance RI is greater than both the source resistance and the load resistance. Our matching procedure is going to be the same procedure as for the pi match. We've broken the problem down into two impedance matching problems that we're going to solve from the left side and the right side. So given a load resistance, a source resistance, and a frequency of operation, we can choose the total quality factor that we want and solve for the intermediate impedance or intermediate resistance. The total quality factor is given by square root of Ri over Rs minus 1 plus the square root of Ri over Rl minus 1. Given these two facts, we can design both the left and right networks. And when we're done, we can combine C1 and C2 by adding the capacitors in parallel. Hence, C1 plus C2 is equal to C. Next, we will look at a couple of specialty networks, tap C and tap L. Now we can also create hybrid networks where we tap at the center point between two inductors or two capacitors instead of using a symmetric network like we saw with the T network or the Pi network. So we'll look at the tap C network. In our tap C network, we have two capacitors C1 and C2, and we have an inductor, and the inductor is going into the common point between the two capacitors right here. Much like we did with our T network, we're going to do a decomposition into two L networks. Our decomposition is a little bit different this time in that on each side of the network we need an R, L, and C so that we have resonant circuits. And in this case we're going to make a virtual inductor LC2 and a virtual capacitor CC2 prime by splitting C2 into these two components. Okay, so what we've done is we need a capacitor and an inductor in both sides, so we split C2 into a virtual inductor, LC2 prime, and a virtual capacitor, CC2 prime, and our rule is going to be that the sum of the susceptances, BC2, is equal to BC2 prime plus BL2 prime. And after this decomposition, our procedure is the same as our T-matching procedure before. We can also envision a tapped L matching network where we tap at a common point between inductors L1 and L2. Here I've drawn this as a pi network. We're going to decompose this into two L networks using the same virtual technique we learned with the tap C match. Okay, we're going to split that L2 into two virtual components, C L2 prime and L L2 prime. And we're going to enforce a rule that the reactance of the original inductor has to equal the sum of the reactances of these two new components. In other words, XL2 is equal to XLL2 prime plus XCC2 prime. After the decomposition, our procedure is the same as the pi matching procedure. We'll note that the intermediate impedance is less than both the source impedance and the load impedance. We can generalize this pi matching procedure. We have four combinations that include a left network and a right network consisting of a parallel reactive component on each side and a series reactive component on each side. And we can configure the networks to be either low pass or high pass for either of these uh, right side or left side networks. Okay, so for our left network, if we want to make it low pass, we would make the shunt component a capacitor and the series component an inductor. If we want to make the right network low pass, we would make the series component an inductor and the shunt component a capacitor. And we can come up with these various combinations for uh, the network being low pass or high pass on either side. Generally, we'll then choose our quality factor and decompose the network. So we decompose into two L matches going from RS to RI and RL to RI. Generally, for each of the L, masses, the L matches, the only requirement is that the 
shunt reactive component has the same has the opposite sign of the series reactive component. In other words, there's one inductor and one capacitor in each of the L matches. Finally, we can combine XS1 and XS2 to form one component with the equivalent series reactants. We can also generalize the T matching procedure in a similar way. I wanted to have a few notes on high pass versus low pass. I've invoked high pass and low pass networks for our discussion of RLC matching circuits, but what does it really mean? We know that RLC circuits should be band pass. So imagine we have a purely series RLC tank where we have a source impedance driving into an LC tank driving a load impedance where the source and load impedances are equal to 50 ohms. If we were to draw the transmission ratio V out over VI, we would see that there'd be some resonant frequency of this network and then we'd have a purely symmetric transmission centered around a mega knot with an amplitude equal to one half. And omega knot would be equal to the square root of one over LC. But our circuits are not purely resonant. We don't have a pure series or parallel combination of the L and C. We typically have something that looks like this. We have an inductor in series between a 50 ohm load and a, a load resistance that's less than 50 ohms due to the downward impedance transformation. And we've tapped the capacitor off of this. So we would say that this circuit is low pass. So why do we say that this is low pass? Well, our series inductance Im impedance causes a faster roll off of high frequency components. So if we look at our transmission ratio, V out over VI for the above circuit, we're going to still see a bandpass response in the sense that away from the center frequency, there is attenuation in both directions. The center frequency is going to be approximately equal to one over the square root of LC if the quality factor is high enough. But we're going to see that the high frequency components get attenuated faster than the low frequency components. Likewise, if we swap the capacitor and inductor and turn this into a high pass network, we're still going to see that we have a center frequency omega knot that is approximately equal to the square root of one over LC. And again, this is if Q is high. But now we're going to see a faster roll off at low frequency than we do at high frequency. So we can indeed say that both networks are bandpass, but the shape can favor the higher low frequencies depending upon the topology that we choose. If you're following along in the OneNote lecture notes, we'll do an example of a tapped capacitor matching network, matching from 200 ohms to 50 ohms at five gigahertz with quality factor equal to five. So our first step for this tap capacitor network is to find the intermediate impedance. So we know that our quality factor total is equal to five. So we need the quality factor of the left network and the right network, and we can simultaneously solve for the intermediate impedance RI, and we find that it's equal to 15.2 ohms. So what we're going to do is a transformation of the left network first, and we're going to note that the impedance looking in this direction needs to be 200 ohms. So we're going to do a series to parallel transformation of C1 and the 15.2 ohm resistance here into following network. Shunt L, shunt C1 parallel equivalent, and a shunt 200 ohm resistor. We won't bore you much with the algebraic details, but what we can do immediately is find the quality factor of this left network uh, and use that to find the equivalent parallel capacitance. We find that parallel capacitance and do a transformation from parallel to series. And note that the capacitance ends up being equal to 602 femtofarads. 
and then we can find the inductor using our resonance formula and find that it's equal to 1.82 nanohenries. We can follow a similar procedure for the right side network. We can follow a similar procedure for the right side network, noting that we're starting at 15.2 ohms and going to 50 ohms. So looking from this point, we're going to do an impedance transformation so that we, can, we see the 50 ohms looking in, in this direction. So what we're going to do is transform L1 and the 15.2 ohm resistor into a, an equivalent parallel circuit. Again, not to bore you with the details, we will grind through a bit of algebra and we can find that the equivalent capacitance is 1.07 picofarads and the equivalent inductance is 735 picofarad, picohenries. And after this point, we have all the component values and we can combine them into a single tap C match. So we're going to stop there for the day. And next we'll start looking at using the Smith chart rather than using these algebraic calculations in order to find impedance matches.